I'm Natalie Brunel for Bitcoin Magazine, and we are talking about Michael Saylor's recent interview with Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Saylor is doing an incredible job trying to orange pill the nation. And on the recent episode of Tucker Carlson today, he pretty much talked for 50 minutes straight about why he feels Bitcoin is a solution to a major problem with our money today, inflation. We wanted to show you some highlights from that interview, starting with Saylor introducing his discussion on what is money, what is the problem with money today, and how does Bitcoin solve it? So money is, is economic energy. The problem is inflation. Because in the history of the world, um, we have inflation. When, uh, when the Romans created gold coins, they start with a certain amount of gold and they would cut the, they would debase the currency, right? Yes. They would cut the amount of gold or cut the amount of silver in the coin. And when they cut it to a small enough level, no one would take the coin anymore. So the mercenaries don't want the coin. The emperor can't pay the mercenaries. The empire topples. If I just issue you paper, you know, whatever the paper might be, and then I triple the supply of the paper, eventually the currency collapses. So the problem with currencies in the history of, of time is the trust in the issuer. Saylor talked a lot about inflation and raised an important point about how we calculate CPI, basically discounting inflation in food and energy. Well, what is inflation? It's not really well understood. Some people think it's CPI. CPI is the rate at which a market basket of consumer goods is going up. But right. the government gets to pick the basket. I've noticed. OK, if I pick things like uh, Domino's Pizza and streaming YouTube videos, they will never go up in price. I can, actually, uh, I can actually adjust the basket, so I just pick things that don't go up in price. Saylor sees inflation as a vector, and he points out that every civilization and empire that has collapsed has collapsed as the result of inflation. When governments want to spend money to finance things like wars, they can only get so much from taxation, so they often resort to printing money or debasing their currency. Today, if you want to be rich, you have to buy scarce assets, as the government inflates our money supply by more than 10% a year. If you're middle class, working class, you're working for cash, and whatever cash you've got, right, um, is either sitting in the bank or uh, you don't have a lot of net cash. So the real significance here is if the dollar loses 20% of its purchasing power each year, then the value of your salary is de deteriorating by 20% a year. It's not falling at the rate of CPI inflation it's falling at the rate of monetary inflation. The road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. Okay. That's the problem. You're a dentist, you're, you're, you're generating 5% more a year for a decade. I'm inflating the money supply at 20% a year for a decade. If you save every penny in 10 years, you'll be able to buy one quarter of what you could have bought today because the price of housing is going up at 20% right. a year, and you're just not ever going to catch up, right? Because now, I've said this before in media commentaries and on the news, inflation sucks the life out of savers and out of the middle class to the benefit of asset holders. And this is my favorite part of the interview where Saylor touches on that concept and refers to Bitcoin as an oxygen mask that basically came out of nowhere. The currency is to the economy what your blood is to your body. And economic energy or money is to the currency what oxygen is to your blood. So common sense says if I keep sucking the oxygen out of the room, if I suck the oxygen out of the room, you're going to either suffocate or freeze to death. And if I keep sucking the economic energy out of the currency, the economy collapses. In the extreme, you get ripped back to Stone Age barter. Right. When the money doesn't work right, anymore, right. I have to trade you cigarettes for bullets. Right. And the problem with that is, is the economy becomes a million times less efficient. Right. If you don't have money. It's like, now, how many countries in the world have a collapsed currency? 66 are dollarized. There's 180 about countries. There's 130 floating currencies. All of them are weaker than the dollar. The U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. The U.S. dollar is expanding. It was expanding 10% a year for a decade, now expanding at 14% a year. It expanded 34% over the past 12 months. The dollar is weakening. Okay, It's like the oxygen is getting sucked out of the room. So Tucker, 
If I told you the oxygen is getting sucked out of the room and there's an oxygen mask drops out of the ceiling over there, what would you do? Run for it. Yeah, put the oxygen mask on. Bitcoin is the oxygen mask. Supply and demand, along with price signals based on real interest rates, lay at the heart of a stable economy, which we have not had for a very long time. And during this part of the interview, Saylor does a great job talking about supply and demand. Uh, with every other asset on Earth, anything else you can own, houses, gold, silver, commodities, stocks, bonds, when the price goes up, the supply increases. If I increase the supply, the price of, of any stock by a factor of 10, the company issues more stock. Of course. If I buy all the bonds, all the municipal bonds, the price of bonds go up, people issue more bonds, right? If I drive up the price of gold by a factor of 10, people print more gold or, or mine more gold. Bitcoin's the only thing in the world that's inelastic to price. If the price of Bitcoin triples, you can't make any more. If the price goes up by a factor of a, a million, you can't make any more. Bitcoin's fixed supply and all the research that Saylor did going down the rabbit hole over the last year is why he decided to make MicroStrategy the first publicly listed company to adopt the Bitcoin standard. How did I get into Bitcoin? I had a company with $500 million in cash earning 0% interest. And I heard the bankers say, we're not even thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. I saw a K-shaped recovery where everybody on Wall Street got 30% richer doing nothing in a year, where everybody on Main Street had to work 30% harder to stay still. That's what I saw last year. If you're on Wall Street with a billion dollars, you ended the year with a billion three. If you're on Main Street working for a living, selling something by the sweat of your brow, you had to raise your prices 30% working harder in order to generate 30% more money to buy the same thing you could have bought before the crisis. And here's a great clip too, where you'll hear just how profitable of a decision it was for Sailor and MicroStrategy to adopt Bitcoin. To make a long story short, we ended up borrowing $2.2 billion at 1.5% interest. We bought the Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has hit an all-time high. We now have about $7.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. We've made about a $4 billion investment profit on it. The stock went from 120 to 850. We generated about eight billion dollars in shareholder value in 12 months. Have you talked to your limited and partners who got out early? <laughs> what? It's complicated when you're a public traded company. I can't even imagine. But, you know, so now what are we? We're, we're like, uh, we're a $500 million software company generating maybe 80 to $100 million a year in cash flow, growing zero to 10% a year. Right. With a seven and a half to $8 billion endowment <laughs> <laughs> that's growing 170% a year. But, you know, it's like, why not? Getting toward the end of the interview, Tucker Carlson asked Saylor about some of the biggest myths and threats surrounding Bitcoin. Can it be copied? Can it be hacked? And can it be banned? Saylor pretty much tore down all those arguments. There's a, there's a kind of misnomer. People often call a cryptocurrencies currencies, but it's not a currency. It's an asset. It's a crypto asset. So, you're right, Tucker. If the government thought it was a currency and if it competed with the U.S. dollar or other currencies, then they would take offense and they will suppress it. But on the other hand, if it's viewed as an asset which competes with gold or with index funds or with bonds or property or real estate, just a store of value or silver, then, you know, you can hold SP, uh, s and index funds and bonds, and you can own land and you can own property. The government would simply like you to disclose when you sell it to someone else at a profit and pay your taxes on it, uh, capital gains tax. And if you wanted to wire $100 million worth of property to someone else, they probably want you to disclose that per the AML, KYC, you know, anti-money laundering. Can it be owned anonymously? It, it, it can be owned anonymously, except... As a practical matter, if you want to acquire large sums of it, you have to acquire them on registered exchanges. Now, if you watch a lot of Michael Saylor interviews, you know that property rights are at the core of his conviction for Bitcoin. And he doesn't see Bitcoin as threatening the U.S. dollar. In fact, he thinks it could strengthen it as the global reserve currency. Saylor pretty much sees Bitcoin as programmatic steel, a rock hard, scarce digital asset meant to be used as a store of value, not necessarily a medium of exchange. And he sees Bitcoin as apolitical, completely bipartisan, and he points out the support on both sides.
there's nothing in this world that you can own that I can't take with force except Bitcoin. Okay. If you take the million dollars and you buy Bitcoin and you take personal custody of it and you own the keys, the keys password is in your head. I hold the gun to your head. Give me your Bitcoin. You can say no. Now, I can still shoot you in the head, but I don't get the property. You see, you can take it. This is the only property in the history of mankind, Tucker, you can take to the grave. The pharaohs wanted to take their gold with them to the grave. They created these pyramids to bury themselves with gold, but grave diggers and grave robbers steal the gold. You can't take anything else with you, but you can take the password in your head. Why is that significant? Well, you study the history of the Jews in the 30s in Nazi Germany, and, and most of them left with, if they were lucky, 10% of their assets. They would have left with all their assets if their assets were in Bitcoin. They couldn't move their house. They can't move a building. You can't haul the gold. Maybe you try to smuggle diamonds. Not very good store of value. It doesn't need to be a medium of exchange. You don't need it. You don't need to replace the U.S. dollar in the Western world to fix things. What you need to do is give people a savings account. I want to hold one month of my salary in dollars. I want to store everything else for the next 10 years or 100 years in an asset which is going up in value. So if you look, if you look at what's happened, <clears throat> the, white, the administration's in favor of this. This is a broadly bipartisan thing. Cynthia Lummis stood up on, on, on the floor of the Senate and said, thank God for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is sound money. It's sound money to the right. It's sound money to the left. Who doesn't want to economically empower everybody on Earth, right? It's, it's good for everybody in the world. There's, there's broad support in the Senate. There's bipartisan support in the Senate and broad support in the House. That was an incredible interview. We hope you all get a chance to check it out. We're going to link it in the description. And, you know, the biggest takeaway is that Bitcoin is digital energy. It is a store of value that is essentially like monetary steel a strong foundation upon which we can build so much value in our lives. For more headlines, head to bitcoinmagazine.com. Yeah. 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 Yeah.